come back. I had to take a couple months off. And uh, in the meantime, I've had people messaging me to say, where have you been? When is Doc's house calls going to come back? Uh, did you quit? So the answer is no, I didn't quit. I'm back. Um, the summer was just crazy busy. My family was traveling in the beginning of the summer. And then I had other things going on. As you can see, I moved into a new office. So between August and September, I was packing up the old office, unpacking it here in the new space, trying to get myself uh, kind of straightened away, but also still trying to run my business. Uh, in the meantime, a couple of weeks ago, um, early October, we had the district time event in Washington, DC, where I was, uh, not me, but my company, NTH, was the lead sponsor. Uh, that was great. Uh, at the same time, uh, the two days prior to district time, we had our second microbrand university workshop, which I had to prepare for. So uh, it's just been really busy, like I said, and I wasn't able to keep up with the uh, Doc's House Calls recording schedule that I tried to set out uh, by doing one of these every couple of weeks. So it just got to be too much, but I am back. Um, I'm not gonna have anybody on with me today because there's a few things I wanted to cover that you know it's, just, it's not good to have somebody else sitting there while I go through all this. Um, so starting with Microbrand University, since we started doing this earlier in the year, a lot of guys have been asking, can we uh, take this show on the road, do one in uh, Europe somewhere or put it up online? Uh, so I have answers to both of those. The first one is we're actually looking at doing our next Microbrand University in March in Dublin, Ireland. So we're still trying to work out the exact dates and uh, place and location and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I think we're going to be in Dublin in March. So for everybody in the EU or the UK, if you can make it there, we'd love to have you. Um, and for those who don't know what I'm talking about, Microbrand University, you can look it up. It's microbrandu.com. But um, it's basically a workshop for brand owners, not necessarily watch brands, although it's mostly about watches, but it actually is applicable to any startup, small business, where we talk about everything from uh, business strategy, product design and development, pricing strategy, fundamentals of you know the financing of running your business, um, marketing strategy, promotion, social media, uh, distribution strategy, retail versus direct to consumer. So we cover all of that in two days and we have a team of experts. There's a guy named John Tour who is um, a uh, former, uh, he's a process engineer. He's worked at GE and 3M. He is from Dublin, Ireland, just why we're thinking about doing it there. Um, he was responsible for launching 22 new products in Europe in two years. And he's taken companies from very small to very large. He's a guy that really knows what he's doing. He's my personal business coach, and he's been responsible for a lot of the growth I've seen in my business over the last couple of years since he and I first met. We also have my chief marketing officer, Josh Irons, who is the former CEO of the Digital Marketing Agency, which was a two-time uh, member of the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies. Um, and then we have John Keel from Watch Gauge, which is probably, if not, certainly one of, if not the fastest growing online retailer of microbrand watches, uh, certainly in America, maybe even the world right now. So John's had his business up and running for two years. It's just growing like wildfire. So uh, those are the four coaches. And um, for those of you that have been asking us to do one in Europe, we're probably going to do the next one in Europe. Uh, for those that have been asking about making microbrand university available online, um, the honest truth is we didn't like the idea at first because um, among other things, you know, how do we protect the content from being distributed widely? But more importantly, we really felt very strongly that um, a lot of the value of Microbrand University is in being there together. Um, we like the idea of young brand owners, startups, even guys that are in the business a few years, getting to know each other, creating that sort of um, stakeholder group or you know network amongst themselves where they can use each other as a sounding board. Um, when I started my business, I quickly became very good friends with uh, Sue Jane Krishnan from uh, Melbourne Watch Company and Chip Yuan from AFIG. And the three of us had um, a very solid, you know, uh, network amongst the three of us where we shared information and helped each other grow and solve problems. So I think that's important. And that's something that we always want to continue to develop in each microbrand university workshop. Uh, we also thought it was really important to have everybody there so that we can answer questions as they come up and, and really make it um, really tailor the content directly to the people that are in the workshop and there to, and so that we can deliver the most value. 
having said all that, and we still feel that way, but having said all that, um, yeah, we realize that it's difficult uh, and expensive to get on a plane uh, and fly around the world to come here to America and sit with us for two days. It maybe isn't convenient if you have another job that you can't get away from, uh, and it's not cheap. So we are looking at putting Microband University online in the future. Um, we're trying to figure out how we can break up that content uh, over two days into smaller, you know, maybe more bite-sized chunks uh, and not see the value decreased. Um, I'm not sure how we're gonna make it as interactive as the online, uh, the in-person course is. Maybe the online course will be uh, more static and basic content uh, and the in-person course will be more of the advanced, more interactive content. So look for that to happen hopefully next year. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple things that have been happening in the industry um, particularly recently, but I think these are things that have been coming for a long time. And I've been talking about them for years, but I've never blogged about it. I've, I've basically just been talking about this stuff on Facebook and on forums, but I think it's really happening uh, or it's coming to fruition right now. And people are seeing it. And I think we're all kind of wondering what's going to happen next. So um, I want to start with the uh, Swatch Group and their plan uh, starting in 2010 to cut off supply of ETA movements to the market by, um, I'm sorry, it was a 2000 plan, um, I'm sorry, 2010, that they were gonna, it's a 10 year plan starting in 2010, they're gonna cut off supply, they said, uh, by 2020. And um, they announced this at 20, in 2010, they got approval from uh, the Swiss organization Comco in 2011. And I think a lot of people in the industry really didn't believe it. They thought that ETA was bluffing. And I know this because I talked to people in the industry and I've asked them what they think. And they've told me, I think ETA is bluffing, that there's just too much money in selling movements, um, that Swatch Group would never truly cut off supply of movements. And I've been arguing for a long time, just the opposite. I think they were serious when they said it, that it makes perfect sense to me. I think that um, if you look at the trends in the watch industry, um, there's a shrinking market. A lot of the Swiss luxury brands are suffering. A lot of them are not as vertically integrated as Swatch Group is, and they rely on companies like Swatch to deliver their movements. And this is particularly true as you get down into the entry level luxury and what I consider to be the mid market, which is everything from say $400 US retail price up to about $1,000 or $1,200 I consider to be the mid market. And um, most of the companies that sell in that space that use um, at a 2824, Solita SW 200 or Miyota 9015, very few of those companies have their own movements. I mean, none of them do really. So we're all kind of reliant on a, a few, a very small number of suppliers to give us movements for our watches. Every micro brand for the most part, um, every you know, mid range, you know, you think about Victorinox and Laco, where do they get their movements from if it's not an in-house movement and most of them don't have them. So I've been saying for years, it makes perfect sense to me that Swatch Group would do this because by cutting off supply of ETA movements and keeping those movements in-house for their own brands like Hamilton, Satina, Mido, Rado, they basically shut all their competitors out of that mid-market entry-level luxury range, which in the last few years, if you look at the numbers that are being put out by the FHS, the Swiss Watch Federation, that's really one of the only areas of the market which is experiencing real solid growth year over year. Not every year, but most years. And it's the only area of the market that actually makes sense to grow. The luxury space is always going to be a game of who are the ultra wealthy people. But for the rest of the world, it's about the mass market. And under $400, the Swiss have been losing ground steadily to uh, Asian companies out of Japan and out of China now, especially. Um, and that mid-market space, I think, is where Swatch Group in particular sees their best opportunity to maintain market share. And by shutting other brands out, by, continue, by not continuing to supply those movements, I think strategically it makes a lot of sense. Now, what was interesting is in 2016, they actually went back to Comco and got Comco to agree to reverse that decision and allow ETA to basically flood the market with um, cheap 28, 24s. And that actually was a real problem for a lot of companies. Um, 
and I'm going to document all this. There was an article in uh, Europa Star called Who Will Succeed at a, but you can read it for yourself. I mean, Techno Time is now out of business. Um, it's been a difficult time for a lot of ETA's competitors. Um, not only does Swatch Group own ETA, but they also own Niverox, which is you know basically a monopoly on hairsprings. Um, for years now, we've been hearing that silicone was going to be the way of the future in hairsprings. Tag Lawyer um, came out with a silicone hairspring model just recently, the new Altavia series. And of course, if you've been paying attention, you probably already know that that watch got um, recalled worldwide. So there's a real problem now with supply. Um, as of 2014, again, I'm going to document this by posting up a picture of the Europa uh, Star Magazine article. As of 2014, Solita was still not completely independent from ETA. Solita was still dependent on ETA for certain parts, not just Niverox hairsprings, but Evoches. So, you know, I don't know if that situation has changed, but we're talking hundreds of thousands of movements that are potentially simply no longer available. So in recent years, we've seen um, other companies try to step up. Uh, the first one was Rhonda. Um, Rhonda, longtime maker of quartz movements. They stopped making mechanical movements decades ago. Now they're back with a new caliber called the R150. This was announced at Basel World in March of 2016. So I was actually in Hong Kong uh, at the September show in September of, of uh, 2016, and I met with Rhonda and I asked them, when is this movement going to be available? What's your annual production capacity going to be? And how is it going to be priced? And what sort of lead times are we going to have? I mean, these are basically very basic questions that a brand owner in the manufacturing business needs to understand of a new supplier. And at that time, um, September of 2016, they couldn't tell me how much it was going to cost. They couldn't tell me what their annual production capacity was going to be. They couldn't tell me what the lead time was going to be. Um, they didn't know when it was going to be ready. So that was six months after they had announced it at Basel World in 2016. I was in Hong Kong again last year, 2018, and I saw Rhonda again, and I asked them the same questions. Now at that time, um, STP, Swiss Technology Productions, which is owned by Fossil, had now hit the market with their STP 1-11 caliber. So I've used it, I know what it costs to buy it in bulk, and I know how it compares to Eta Solita and the Yoda movement. So I, you know, I've got a good feel for you know, where a movement supplier needs to be to be competitive. Um, here's where it got interesting. So as of uh, September 2018, Rhonda still couldn't tell us exactly when it would be ready. They said sometime hopefully in late 2019, which is obviously now. Um, they said they weren't exactly sure what their production capacity was going to be, but they, you know, I tried to nail them down. I said, you know, more than 10,000, more than 50, more than 100. And they said, no, 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 like definitely not that big. And I said, well, you know, more than 5,000? And they go, oh yeah, more than 5,000. So I take that to mean they could probably deliver 5,000 movements a year, which in the greater scheme of things is nothing. You know, we're talking about 1.4 million Etas and Solitas as of 2014 and 5,000 movements compared to what's being removed from the market right now is just absolutely nothing. So uh, last year, Shinola, um, was using the Rhonda movement in their um, Lake Monster series of divers. When Shinola makes you know watches and they buy 5,000 movements, they're buying all of them from Rhonda. This year, I think it's Waco using the Rhonda movements. I don't want to throw them under the bus, but behind the scenes, I've asked around. At least one person told me they heard the Rhonda movement was unstable and there's some problems, you know, getting dialing in the reliability of it. And this is not unusual for a new uh, movement supplier. It's very common that for the first couple of iterations, the first couple of production runs, they have to get the movements out into the market and then see what the experience is and then, you know, kind of fix whatever's wrong. So it's not a knock on Rhonda necessarily. It's just an acknowledgement that Rhonda is not going to save the industry from a lack of edits, uh, which that brings up then STP. Swiss Technology Productions, another Swiss movement supplier with a drop-in replacement for the ETA 2824, owned by Fossil, publicly traded company, billion dollar market capitalization, obviously a company with the resources to develop their own caliber and you know get it out in the market and hopefully invest in production capacity so that they can scale up and replace what ETA isn't putting into the market. Now, 
I honestly have no idea what STP's annual capacity is. But Zodiac, which is also owned by Fossil, has been using some non-STP calibers. Uh, in particular, their recent GNTs, which were a huge hit. STP doesn't have a GNT, so they had to use Edas or Salidas. Um, but the fact is that I've used STPs in two models. We used 300 pieces in, in the um, NTH Tropics. We moved, used another 350 pieces in the Devil Ray. We had about a 10% defect rate overall. It was higher on the Tropics. We kind of got it down into a more manageable level on the uh, Devil Ray. And I've talked with other brand owners. They've had similar experience. Again, I'm not trying to throw STP under the bus. I recognize that a new movement supplier is going to have their issues up front uh, and that they have to work those out. But from my perspective as a brand owner, I'm not prepared to make another big investment in a movement until I know from others in the business that they've ironed out the kinks and it's more reliable now than it was. Um, recently, I've heard Felsola Shot has movements available, but they said something like they had 2,000 pieces ready in inventory, ready to deliver. Quite honestly, the, the prices were unbelievable. Um, oh, so going back to uh, Rhonda, real quick. The um, price that they quoted me in 2018 was the same exact price that you could buy an STP for. So clearly they understand, you know, where their bogey is. The, the STP is basically the benchmark that they're working against as an alternative to ETA. So back to FELSA. Um, this year, just in the last few months, I've heard that FELSA was shot, has some ETA clones, uh, drop-in replacement for ETA available. Quite honestly, the prices sounded too good to be true. And I couldn't verify if they were new old stock or if you know they were just rebranded Chinese calibers, we don't know. So I've decided not to use those in a future production. Um, here's where it starts to get even more interesting. So like I said, two weeks ago, we were in DC for district time. The morning of district time, all hell broke loose. Tempest Fugit, among others, um, Tempest Fugit written by James Anderson. You know, I've recommended it strongly for anybody that wants to know what's going on in the business, read that blog. James at Tempest Fugit broke the news, among others, that there's a new movement supplier in town. Atelier um, is going to be selling Swiss-made drop-in replacements for the ETA 2824, but with um, a completely different caliber design. It's uh, a little bit similar to the Rolex, um, is my sort of layman's understanding, um, the Rolex design um, when it comes to the balance and uh, the escapement. I'm not a watchmaker. Uh, I'm not trained as a watchmaker, so you know the, the tech technology involved is a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but it looks like it's got superior specs and performance um, to the ETA 2824. Currently, the pricing is a little bit more than the 2824, but I think it's worth it. Um, the big news here is, although the current calibers that they have in their inventory are Swiss made, they're trying to bring it back to America and make a truly American made caliber. So, that's going to be an interesting story to see develop. All of this is happening at the same time as Miyota just announced that they are discontinuing several of the calibers in the 82 series and the 6000 series, which is, I think, the hand wind version of the 82 series. They're not discontinuing the 8215 or the 8217, which is the um, you know subdial at nine version of the 8215. So those are two of the more popular. Um, calibers in that 82 series from Yoda. And that 82 series, for those who know, is really kind of the most entry level Japanese movement you can buy if you're a micro brand or just another brand like Lako uh, trying to source Japanese movements. So there's a shortage of supply now because even though they're still making the 8215, they're cutting out a lot of the other calibers and there aren't very many good um, reliable, ready, readily available alternatives to some of those calibers they're getting rid of. Um, we're seeing lead times and prices going up on all movements, Japanese and Swiss, even Chinese now. So Miyota is raising the prices on their 9000 series, which is the more popular sort of next level up series of movements. We're seeing costs go up across the board. As of September, uh, thanks to the you know trade war that America's president Donald Trump is waging with China, there's a new 15% tariff that goes into effect or went into effect in September on all watch imports from China. 
In fact, all um, anything watch related coming from China is at least a 15%, maybe even a 25% tariff on top of ordinary customs. So we're seeing costs go up because of tariffs. We're also seeing costs and lead times go up uh, due to a shortage of movements because of what ETA is doing, but also because of what Miyota is doing and what Seiko is doing. Because they all see um, when Swiss raise their prices, the Japanese are right behind them. We've been hearing about some uh, Chinese made ETA clone that is some sort of a Chinese German hybrid. It's certified in Germany. Um, I'm actually hopeful that that works out. I know a couple of guys in the business who are looking at that very closely and are working on a new model using those movements. And if it works out, that'd be great for everybody. But um, you know, the fact is that right now, looking forward into 2020, a lot of micro brands are gonna have a hard time. A lot of big size brands that aren't that micro are gonna have a hard time. Anybody that is, making watches, but doesn't have their own in-house supply is going to be going to the same market as everybody else, trying to source the same movements as everybody else. Uh, and prices are going up, lead times are going up. When this happened back in 2015, 2016, um, I saw personally that defect rates went up. Anytime the movement suppliers start to increase their production capacity in order to keep up with demand, there's typically a decrease in quality as a result. So I would say that I'm not exactly sure what's gonna happen next year, but I think a few things could possibly happen. The first one is we could see some brands going out of business, which is exactly what I think Swatch Group wants when they cut off supply better movements. Um, we could see brands raising prices, which I think has to happen when costs go up. You know, it's tariffs, it's the you know, cost of movement, it's the defect rate. Um, I think, you know, hopefully we'll see some more movement suppliers come online. But from what I can see, there's really nobody right now that can replace ETA and Salida if Salida can't be independent from ETA. Um, and, you know, again, Swatch Group owns Never Rocks, which is, you know, basically a monopoly on hairsprings. So, you know, if Swatch Group decides to cut off all supply of Never Rocks hairsprings and all supply of ETA movements and all supply of Nebo Shays to companies like Salida, it's a real big problem. Um, so I'm hopeful that in the future, possibly the near future, um, we'll start to see um, more vendors come online. Um, I'm hopeful about these guys down in Arizona, FTS, that are talking about, they've got this AmeriCorps movement right now, um, which if you're into micro brands, you're probably um, not into quartz movements at all, but I think they're talking about trying to develop their own in-house um, mechanical caliber, which would be great. Um, Atelier coming online is interesting. Um, I've talked to some other guys about, you know, what can we do to bring watchmaking in a big way back to America and start mass producing um, an American made movement, but also how can we do more production of the other parts, cases, bracelets, clasps, you know, all of that. If we can do that here and assemble here, um, I think we not only create jobs, but we can also alleviate some of the problems in the business, um, but we got to figure out how to do it in a way that's efficient from a cost perspective, because obviously labor rates here in America are so much higher than they are in, in places like China. Um, so there's a lot going on. And like I said, I don't have a crystal ball in the future. I don't know exactly how it's all going to shake loose, but what I do know is we're already seeing the effect. I just saw another competitor um, cancel a project, refund everybody's money, um, they cited the Trump tariffs, the rising cost of movement, and also a recent decision by PayPal to um, stop refunding their transaction fees um, when somebody cancels an order, like a pre-order. So that's going to make it harder for startups as well. So a lot going on, and um, I don't know what's going to happen in 2020, but it's going to be an interesting year to watch. Um, this year, a year to date, has been a bit strange. Um, in its own right. So yeah, next year is going to be even more strange, I think. And I think it's going to open a lot of people's eyes. So hopefully it all works out. But um, like I said, it'll be interesting. So hopefully that is um, informative for you guys. If you have any questions, by all means, post them down below in the comments. I'll try to get to those as quickly as I can and, uh, and answer. And just please understand that, you know, I'm just one guy. I'm only repeating what I've heard um, directly from suppliers as well as from other guys in the business. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to get uh, a straight answer out of some of these vendors and some of these companies, but um, it's real and I wouldn't, you know, BS anybody about it. So, you know, hopefully everybody kind of sees that what I'm saying is, tr is true. Um, 
you know, it's demonstrably true. And, um, you know, don't shoot the messenger. So that's it. Thanks for tuning in. Come back uh, next week, the week after. We'll have another episode, another microbrand owner. And um, hopefully you guys enjoy that just as much as you have the past episodes. Take care. Mm-hmm.